Welcome back to ASM Live, the internet talk show live from the 2012 general meeting of the American Society for Microbiology in San Francisco. I'm your host today, Stanley Malloy. I'm the chair of the ASM Communications Committee and dean of the College of Sciences at San Diego State University. I want to encourage those of you who are watching online to please ask questions. You can use the chat function from the video viewer or send questions on Twitter through hashtag ASM2012. And those of you in the audience, we encourage you to ask questions too anytime. Questions liven up the discussion, and so please send your questions. In this session, we are talking to Lu Zhang and Winfrey Wong, both of Ohio State University, and both with an interest in antibiotic resistance in non-food animals. So, an antibiotic resistance is, of course, a very important and growing problem. There's been a lot of publicity about antibiotic resistance in animals that are specifically associated with food. But our two guests today have a really different perspective on this process. So, Would you like to tell us a little bit about your findings? OK. Um, as we have recognized, the rapid emergence of antibiotic resistance um, in pathogens has been, a, has been a major public health concern. And most efforts have been focused on um, clinical pathogens as well as uh, food animals. We know recently that FDA has just issued a ban on the use of cephalosporin in um, food animals starting this April. So um, in our perspective view, we are actually doing something different. We're focusing on the prevalence of um, resistance in non-food animal, in particularly, in particular the resistant population as well as the resistant gene reservoir in non-food animals. Um, in particular, we're focusing on pet and zoo animals. We choose zoo, pet and zoo animals due to several reasons. First, the quantity. They are in huge quantity. They are believing there are f over 50 million uh, dogs and cats raised by, in, as a pets by uh, American families. And this, this is different from clinical pathogens. These, um, these group, this type of animals, they are not routinely exposed to antibiotic selective pressure, which means uh, we used to think the antibiotic selection pressure used to be the major driving force for the evolution of resistance in pathogens as well as commensal bacteria. So we use these animals. These animals are not routinely exposed to antibiotics. And also, they live in close proximity to us, which means they, if they come up with a problem, it will directly impact us. So our findings, um, we, in our findings, we find that the uh, significant resistant population evolved in pet animals and zoo animals, even in the absence of antibiotic selective pressure. And we also find detect a significant uh, size of resistant gene pools associated with these animals. So it's an interesting finding because uh, no one has ever well, studied, um, I mean, really, um, this is a, our significant finding on the problems of resistance associated with non-food animals. So, of course, zoo animals and pets, some subset of them will get antibiotics. So in your studies, do you exclude the antibiotic-treated animals from the others when looking at this issue? So, yeah, yeah, we are trying to identify, uh, I mean, apart from the antibiotic select pressure, which is already recognized as a driving force of, for the evolution of antibiotic resistance in pathogens and commensals, we are trying to identify, uh, you know, additional source, additional risk factors that contribute to the evolution of antibiotic resistance in, um, in bacteria. So without this selective pressure for antibiotic resistance, mm -hmm. uh, w why do you think it's so prevalent in populations that aren't treated with antibiotics? Well, I think um, right now it's still an ongoing study, but um, based on our uh, point of view, it has something to do with the environment. First of all, um, we have the current view of um, microbial ecosystem in, in terms of resistance, antibiotic resistance, we have three main reservoirs of uh, gene pool. For example, um, food animals, which is the biggest consumer of antibiotics. They consume 80% of antibiotics produced annually in the U.S. market. 
And of course, a human in hospital, the hospital acquired antibiotic resistance. This is a major um, gene reservoir. And the third important source is a human community. I mean, so these, um, and also the, there are two important selective pressure, antibiotic selective pressure. One in food animal, like I said, is consume 80% of antibiotics, and also the clinics. So these elements in the ecosystem, they are connected by the environment. So if we keep doing the thing like they evolve the uh, antibiotic resist resistance and they're gonna feed back to the environment, which is gonna oh, therefore feed back to the pets and us. So, so the antibiotic resistant organisms in the environment are kind of eco-tourist, if you will, from the pets Pretty much. And, and the clinics and, and their treatment. Mm -hmm. it, that's very interesting. It would be interesting to know something about the stability of them within the animals. You could imagine, for example, mm -hmm. that there could be a selective factor that we don't recognize, but some environmental factor that uh, is distinct from the human developed antibiotics that could be important here as well, correct? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, uh, there are uh, quite some research focusing on the stability mechanism of resistance. And it's been reported that the resistance once involved in the hose, it, it become quite stable in the absence of antibiotic selective pressure. And there are uh, ongoing efforts focusing on the um, mechanism that um, the stability of resistance in the absence of selective pressure. For example, um, we have seen reports that um, for the resistant genes on the same plasmid, there's a mobile elements that can disseminate to from one host to another. Um, these plasmids also contain um, advantages metabolic mechanisms. So they are like a co-selection by other advantages uh, genetic feature. That's very interesting. Wenfei, now you've had a very different perspective on this same problem. Could you tell us about your work? Uh, well, I uh, basically was interested in the amount of antibiotic uh, resistant bacteria carried by houseflies. And uh, as you know, like general sense, houseflies are uh, insects that are commonly associated with uh, human habitations. And uh, it, they also carry, uh, already carry multiple res uh, pathogens. And just a few research have been uh, identifying uh, the antibiotic pathogens that has been carried by houseflies. So uh, I was very interested in finding uh, on the broader perspective that uh, what is the magnitude of the antibiotics and commensal bacteria carried by houseflies. And uh, what we did was that we collect houseflies from uh, a few different locations, uh, including farming uh, environments and also residential areas. And uh, we were uh, surprised that uh, we actually found quite a number of resident bacteria carried by them in both the farming facility and also the residential areas. So um, uh, that, that was quite uh, interesting, I, I think. So given the extent of antibiotic resistance as on the farms, as we've just heard, right. you might expect that in the farm environment, it might be more prevalent mm -hmm. in houseflies than the resistant bacteria in the non-farm urban environment. Is that true? Right. Uh, that's, uh, that's true in uh, our study in some extent. I think uh, for uh, you know, prevalence data, the phenotypic prevalence data, we were able to see a trend where Houseflies uh, collected near the farming facility uh, had uh, uh, more resident populations than residential areas. But, um, however, all these samples had uh, their resident populations were all quite high. You know, uh, for example, they range from like 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 uh, county from units, which is quite high. I think for those of you who who understand that uh, it's quite high for resident populations. And then we're also able to identify, uh, actually determine the positive AR encoding genes, the genes responsible for antibiotic resistance uh, from all the flies uh, collected at different locations, including the residential locations, also at the farming locations. And those results actually vary. So I think uh, both these areas uh, also, uh, both flies uh, fly from all of these areas are also able to carry antibiotic resistance at a great extent. So, so what types of resistance did you discover? Uh, well, we uh, selected for uh, tetracycline and erythromycin uh, resistance. Uh, these two antibiotics are uh, also widely used in agriculture. Uh, and uh, we also transferred uh, the, these uh, resistant isolates to, uh, I think, uh, one cephalosporin and uh, 
also uh, cefotaxime uh, to other uh, types of antibiotics and also to screen for the multiple resistance data. And uh, what we found was that uh, in this case, that the, the animal farming uh, facility isolates actually had a, a very high uh, resistance to multiple antibiotics than the residential areas. So, yeah. So now, to... now, Lou, did you find a similar kind of pattern of antibiotic resistance? Uh, one possibility is, in fact, that the flies are flying right. from the farms or the clinics on, and exposing these non-food animals to the antibiotic resistance. And that may be the air route for transmission of antibiotic resistance. Well, this, um, the air flies is just, flies is just, uh, I was saying it's definitely an important source of the dissemination route of resistance from different sources, from farm and hospital to human community. Um, and uh, also, like I said, the uh, resistance population and the gene pool are significantly found from the, the pets manure sample, pets ways and animal ways. This is also contribute to the, because you know, um, the, the ways they are like, the amount of manure is huge. There are like 660 billion pounds of animal waste produced in the U.S. annually. So it becomes a, it becomes a huge, constitutes a huge impact to the environment as a source of resistant gene pool, gene pool reservoir, as well as the, tight, the source of resistant population. And I think that houseflies, they commonly breed in these manures that are untreated manures. And this, we could see a potential uh, correlation between you know, the, the, uh, the pet animals and also the different uh, farming facility manures and residents. So I encourage people from the audience and our viewers online to ask questions if you have any. Be happy to respond to any of your questions. Question yes. from the audience. One minute, we'll bring the microphone. Hi. But neither of you have actually seen any instances of the bacteria being transmitted to people or between pets and other animals, for instance, right? Uh, I think in, in my study, uh, like past studies for uh, studying houseflies, they have been uh, able to identify houseflies carrying a particular strain of pathogens, opportunist pathogens, that they are able to transfer them to different, what the test was transferring to ready to eat food. So they had a hamburger patty uh, and they put them in a lab setting and uh, the flies landed, uh, they kept the flies in this closed box for five minutes and the, uh, the patty was, after they tested the patty, already contained this antibiotic-resistant pathogen. So there is uh, this kind of transfer going on, at least for, uh, from my understanding, in house flies. Um, in my study, uh, we have identified the identity of most of the resistant gene carriers. If they carry a resistant gene, they might have a potential to disseminate the gene to, to residential bacteria in hosts like human. Most of the resistant gene uh, carriers identified by our study, they are either lactic acid bacteria or enterobacteria AC. They belong to the same group as what we found in human um, GI tract. So yes, they have a great potential to, by disseminating the resistance to human hosts, by directly colonization, by either directly colonization to our gut, or they can transmit their resistance gene to similar residential bacteria in human gut. Now, are some of the microbes that you've discovered resistant in natural pathogens or human pathogens? Uh, I think like what Lou just said, uh, most of our uh, uh, isolates that were we collected, the, the AR gene carriers, actually were belongs to the enterobacteria and, and also the lactic acid bacteria genesis. And uh, uh, some of you may be familiar, uh, and some of these uh, species in this genesis are able to, uh, can be opportunist pathogens. And for example, some species in the Providencia uh, genus that we, uh, that we are able to identify uh, can cause a human upper uh, urinary tract infections. So uh, there is the potential for them to become pathogens as well. Yeah, in my point of view, since we use the limited um, cultivation conditions as well as the, the, you know, the limited number of resistant genes we're looking at, we got uh, just a small portion of the picture. But since our cultivation conditions, if the commensal bacteria, they count over 99% in the environment. So there's a great chance we re the, the bacteria recovered in our study, they're commensals rather than pathogens because they're only 1%. And if we don't use a selective 
media, culture media conditions to recover these type of pathogens, we, not, we might not be able to, to see them since they're present in such a small portion in the environment. And I think one of the main reasons we focus on commensal bacteria is that because the chance of, uh, we're trying to find the, the amount of antibiotic resistance carried by commensal bacteria is that the chance of commensal bacteria to transfer these resistant genes by horizontal tr gene transfer to pathogens are much more likely than to have pathogens transferring to pathogens, which are relatively less in uh, the pool of bacteria that in the environment. If you think of studies where people have looked at antibiotic resist resistance in among the most pristine environments you might have, mm -hmm. that is, most distant from areas of high human use of antibiotics, do you know how that compares with these situations where you're looking at animals and insects that are very close to human and agricultural populations? So, uh, Basically, you mean like in a hospital setting? No, or? so for example, on a coral reef, mm -hmm. far out in the middle of the Pacific. Okay. Well, we do have similar efforts, this is ongoing efforts. We're trying to compare the, the baseline of antibiotic, the presence of antibiotic resistance. We basically, we're trying to go distance into the environment. For example, we collect sample from Yellowstone National Park, which is, we, we think is a wild place, but uh, you know, it's not as well as the, the root coral reef, but um, we're trying to compare the, the baseline, but it's, it's definitely, it's an important effort and it's a part of the ongoing study. I, th I think it's a, the, part of the reason I ask this question is because some of the people who thought very hard about antibiotic resistance, like Julian Davies, mm -hmm. he said, the world is bathed in antibiotics. And, and so there is this pressure everywhere you go in the entire world because so many antibiotics are used that they've, they've spread out to a, a pretty high level. And, and I think that the kind of work that you are doing could really allow you to test those kinds of predictions. Right, I think it's very important for surveillance against antibiotic resistance in different environments. And uh, I think continual efforts should be uh, on uh, finding new areas where uh, we haven't tested before. Uh, and I think, uh, uh, also, one of my lab, other lab mates, uh, Isha, who's also in the audience today, she did like the soil samples in residential areas. And she, I think she was also able to find resistant genes and resistant bacteria also in the soil samples, not only in the farming facility, but also, you know, uh, relatively uh, further away. So uh, I think resistance is pretty widespread, but we do need to uh, take more surveillance efforts in to, uh, to, to provide like a more comprehensive picture on antibiotic resistance issue. The, do, you, do you have a feeling whether with house flies, whether one house fly can transmit to the other house fly? Uh, I, I believe so, but I don't believe uh, research have been done on that subject. But um, I do believe, I think there was one study that they did, they did not do house fly to house fly, but they actually did uh, house flies to a cattle and to, you know, in like a cattle farming facility. And uh, just for one landing, uh, by transferring the external bacteria onto the, uh, I think they did ex E. coli, uh, E. coli, uh, and then they were able to, and just by one landing, they were able to transfer 10 to, I don't have the data on top of my head, but they were trans able to transfer a lot of bacteria to the cattle. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, if the house flies interact with, with each other, I believe they're also able to transfer these bacteria to each other as well. You know, we've grown to love our pets so much that we can't imagine they could do something harmful to us, like transmit antibiotic resistance. And in fact, even with house flies, I, I don't know too many people who like house flies, right. but even with house flies, I think the, the public awareness of the public health threat of transmission from house flies has really diminished over the last decade or so. Right, I think mainly because of uh, the, the, the eradication efforts in, in the past that they were trying to limit the amount of houseflies in different environments. But I think houseflies during the summer this is still very prevalent in our samples because some of the samples that we collected are just right next to uh, like a trash can in a residential area and we were able to collect uh, a lot over a period of three days. So 
um, if you have a housefly, say you're sitting uh, outside your home and then a housefly lands on your uh, skin and then you happen to, uh, I don't know, touch your face or something, it can be possible to transfer this bacteria, but we, we really do need to, uh, to uh, do more studies to, 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 to uh, come to a conclusion on that, but I think it is also uh, an insect vectors in particular, also a neglected subject in antibiotic resistance. Again, I encourage our audience to ask questions online through hashtag ASM2012. Looks like we have another question from our audience. Hi, yes. I'm curious if you all have looked at the transfer of this antibiotic resistance through the food chain. For example, spiders that may consume these flies and then make the spider a, a risk of infection uh, to an individual. That's actually a very nice question, but we haven't looked at that uh, uh, through like, you know, the entire food chain of the animal interactions. We haven't looked at that. Uh, I, I don't know even if, I, I, I think, I believe spiders, if they do eat the flies, they, the bacteria is able to survive inside its gut, but I, I'm not like expert on, on that. So I don't know if the bacteria will survive or if it can be transmitted to other uh, animals as well. But in terms of human food chain, like we all know that antibiotic resistance is able to, to carry through. I, I want to know about the old lady who swallowed the fly. <laughs> And I think there's like, I saw on the internet the other day that uh, they did the research and say the humans uh, on average, uh, when you, after you sleep, you swallow like three spiders per, per night. That's the study that they did. I was very surprised by that. So maybe if <laughs> spiders contain a lot of <laughs> antibiotic resistance, it might be another source of, you know, uh, surveillance that we have to take. So this is a great example of, of environment animals and people right. and how they all come together when you think about transmission of disease or all of these other factors you, you can't really separate one from another because they're so interwoven and, and carefully connected right i think uh right now it, uh, since in the scientific uh community we're all focusing more and more and more on interdisciplinary research so I think uh, this is also applies to antibiotic resistance, where we, ha well, we have to focus on the entire AR ecosystem to, to really get a good understanding of its uh, development, circulation, and evolution. So. Right, absolutely. Right. That's a, um, it, it, it becomes a, a really intriguing question as well about how you do the study. So how do you identify the genes associated with antibiotic resistance and the microbes that carry antibiotic resistance? Well, basically, um, we, we extracted the total DNA from the feces directly, and we identify, we run the real-time PCR attempt, it's a type of technique identify to measure the size of targeted resistant gene pool, the size of gene pool, and it's, this is the culture-independent method, which means we didn't really culture anything, just because we directly extract the DNA from the feces. On the other hand, we also identified the some of the resistant um, isolates based on um, culture-dependent method. We normally we enumerate the the fecal samples on culture recovered is resistant isolates on the plate, supplemented with corresponding antibiotics, and we test the prevalence of resistant genes in these recovered phenotypic resistant isolates, and we got a number like percentage. Like 20% of all tetracycline resistant back isolates that carry TetM gene, for example. And then we identify some of the representative, representative um, resistant gene carriers. We're trying to identify the, the, the identity based on their 16S RDNA sequence analysis. So. And did you use similar types of approaches? Uh, yes, we, we did. So basically, uh, like Lou said, we collect these isolates from the media that contain antibiotics. And we also transfer these isolates to uh, the media that contain other antibiotics to see if it can be phenotypically resistant to multiple antibiotics. And then uh, basically we identify the positive uh, resistant genes to prove that the genes are actually in there that confer resistance. But I think um, because for each antibiotic, for example, tetracycline, uh, the, they have 30 genes, different genes that, can, that are resistant to this antibiotic. 
and I think in our study we only did a limited number of genes. So if we're able to do, uh, to do more screen against more antivirus genes, I think our results will be just on the genetic side will be uh, bigger than uh, what we have now because and it's very labor extensive since and uh, we're only able to identify a few genes rather than the whole 30 or 31 genes that are available right now. Well, thank you very much. This has been a very interesting story. We learned some more about how important issues related to human health may be located in parts of the environment that we don't normally associate with human health. And I think it says a lot about changes in the way science is done now, the ability to detect things that a few short years ago would have been very hard to detect. And so thank you very much for your stories today. I think it is very intriguing, especially to compare with some of the other microbiome stories that you're hearing at this ASM meeting and the changes associated with that. So I'd like to make sure to invite you back. We'll have another issue of ASM Live here at 12 noon, about a half hour from now. And we're going to be talking in that session about One Health. So some more about this importance of the interface of environment, animals, and people in the transmission and evolution of infectious diseases. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Explore the fundamental role of microbes in the natural history of our planet with Microbes in Evolution, the world that Darwin never saw. Available at eStore.asm.org.